today we have with us Anjali Joseph. Anjali, hello. Hello. How are you? <laughs> yeah, good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. It's the first time I've seen you since lockdown began. I've, I've spoken to you on the phone, but I haven't right, seen you. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So just to introduce you, Anjali, to all the viewers, Anjali is a British Indian author who was born in Mumbai um, and then came over to the UK when she was seven to Leamington, Leamington Spa, I believe. Um, yeah read English at Trinity College, Cambridge, and then went back to um, India and came back to do a master's in creative writing at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, which is where we met. Um, she is author of four novels. Saraswati Park was her first novel. It won an array of prizes, the Desmond Elliott Prize, the Betty Trask Prize, and jointly won the Vodafone Crossword Book Award for Fiction in India. Another country was long listed for the Man Asian Literary Award, and The Living was shortlisted for the DSC Prize. Everlasting Lucifer, her fourth novel, um, began life as a short story and was longlisted for the Sunday Times Short Story Award. Um, so, first of all, Anjali, how has lockdown, lockdown life been treating you? Um, how you found it? Uh, yeah, actually, really nice. I think uh, probably for lots of writers, it's in some ways not that difficult, different from a, a regular routine. Yeah, and lots of staying in and reading and writing, and it, I guess the difference is just that everyone else was doing it too. But um, I guess there was a d sort of definite atmosphere at the beginning. It was kind of more everyone was more worried generally about you know the whole situation and stuff. And of course now it's it's more relaxed uh, in terms of just yeah. spending time outdoors and all that stuff. So that's nice. Yeah, yeah. it's relaxed quite a lot over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. And um, in a way, I wanted to start here because you've done something really interesting, although I'm going to sort of run through your novels, but you've done something really interesting creatively throughout lockdown period. You have put out your, um, your most recent novel, which is, is not yet out formally and published in book form, but yes, you put it out through um, audio recordings and paintings. So... <laughs> Yeah, can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I didn't even know that you painted. So these beautiful watercolours appeared on Instagram with links to each chapter of your story, um, which you ran more or less maybe three or four times a week, I think. Right. Down. Uh, so talk me through, like, what, what made you decide to, to do that? What was the thinking behind it? Um, so uh, I, I sort of have to cast my mind back because I finished doing it a little a few weeks ago. I can't remember, a month or two ago. Mm. But um, uh, I guess there were lots of things that fed into it. One is that I really used reading aloud as a sort of editing tool. Okay. Um, and with this book in particular, I kind of uh, just mentally flirted with the idea of in some way publishing it like a serial novel, you know, like uh, maybe online or something. Um, I was kind of intrigued with that idea of um, somebody like Dickens who was writing um, in a way quite an eventful narrative, but also writing it on the fly and sort of pulling out all these threads, some of which would later become uh, important plot points and some of which would just sort of hang there and it would be fine. Yeah. Um, and I thought that might be really fun. But I didn't end up doing that, but I did end up reading um, in front of an audience, like at various kind of readings that I did in... Um, I teach in Oxford at the uh, MST program there. And so every year I do a reading there, but other places as well. I've sort of, at public readings, I've read actually quite a lot of the book. Um, and in terms of editing it, I also used that as a sort of tool. But um, it was also because it was just taking a while to find a publisher and I was in between agents and other things were happening. And I kind of thought that it would be a nice way of sort of uh, putting the book out there so that I could actually move on mentally and kind of, start work on the next project instead of feeling like this was still a sort of not completely finished task I guess um, and then I'd also just started I used to paint when, a lot when I was a child um, but for some reason I'm not sure why I didn't take my paints to university and I just kind of stopped doing it at that point um, I, or maybe it was slightly earlier I do remember I wanted to do GCSE art in my school and um, which had quite a, a big art department and I kind of said so to one of the art teachers and he was just like oh no, I think you're more sort of academic. Um, really? Yeah, which I think was sort of a way of saying like, you're not that good. But it's sort of funny because it was a comprehensive school and like no one ever got told, you know, not to do French or not to do English literature or whatever. Yeah, all right. Um, so I don't really know why I listened to him, but I think, uh, yeah, so I didn't do GCSE art. 
um, and maybe I wouldn't have enjoyed it that much anyway. You know, it, it was quite, um, it wasn't that sort of, it wasn't like just drawing for fun, was it? It was kind of much more regimented mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. But um, but I did sort of envy everyone who was doing art and carrying their big black portfolio cases around and stuff. I was kind of, kind of like, oh. Um, <laughs> but I didn't do art at school. And then I get uh, after like 14 or 15 and maybe I just painted a bit at the weekends. And then I didn't really paint after that. Um, Till pretty much now. I mean, I, okay. I used to sometimes sketch a little bit or carry like um, a little notebook around and draw a bit, but I didn't really do it in any sort of sustained way, which is funny because it's something I really loved doing when I was a child. I would probably spend mm -hmm. one day of the weekend, pretty much every weekend, like, you know, spending hours doing a painting or something. So, and was it um, watercolors that you used as a child, or did you mess around with different? It was watercolor, actually. Yeah, that's something my mum used to use. And so I guess that's what I did. And I also used gouache a bit later on. Right. But, um, I've never tried like oil and acrylic. Okay. So it was always watercolor. Yeah. And how's it been going back to it? Did you, did it take a while to get into the paintings or um, did you feel no, like you found your form quite quickly? I th I was really aware that I didn't know how to draw lots of stuff. So, um, uh, you know, I'd, and, and also in lockdown, obviously you can't necessarily, uh, I mean, you're in your house, so it's, it's difficult to sort of go out and observe people or things or whatever, but mm -hmm. you know, obviously there are lots of, you can find photos online if you want to find a photo, like if you want to know what it looks like when somebody is, holding a cup to their face or <laughs> whatever it is or what a booth looks like in a bar or something so it's definitely a learning curve and they're not like amazing drawings but I did really enjoy doing them I think it's when I started painting again I kind of uh I just thought oh maybe I'll I was sort of planning to have a sabbatical of sorts like a kind mm. of year off teaching and also just focusing on um the new book but maybe also just doing things that didn't have any sort of obvious um goal really right fun and I sort of, and I kind of thought, oh, maybe painting. I'm not sure why it sort of came back at this point, you know, and not earlier. So I started, and then a friend of mine suggested, you know, he said, oh, you should do like a watercolor for each reading, and it was just a good way of. Otherwise, I guess I would have been painting all the objects in my house, you know, which after a while, <laughs> which I still do. I've got a lot of drawings of like the view from my bedroom window and the chair in my bedroom and stuff. But I guess there's a limit to how many times. Um, that can be interesting. So it was kind of nice to have this challenge of, of illustrating something. It was sort of fun. Yes, and a daily illustration as well. Yeah. Very regular. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the experience of reading for the recordings, I mean, I know you say that you read your work out loud anyway, but did you hear different things in the stories you were reading? And did it make you think, oh, I would have edited that differently had I known that I was producing this for audio? Yeah. Would it have changed the story, do you think? Had you written specifically for audio in the first place? That's so interesting. I've had offers in the last year or two. There have been times when, um, I don't even remember the names, but there was somebody um, working for an app that was kind of uh, big in Scandinavia and also was starting up in India, um, kind of like Audible, but it wasn't Audible, mm. um, where they commissioned writers to produce content exclusively for them. And right. so the person was sort of saying, oh, do you want to do that? But basically the copyright would be, be with us and it would be like, you know, kind of like writing directly for Netflix or something. Um, yeah, and so I, was, I was just like that. I don't know, because it takes me <laughs> quite a long time to write a novel and the idea of sort of writing something that's essentially that you're just selling wholesale to another platform seems yeah. sort of, um, it didn't really seem to make sense for me. But it's a sort of interesting idea, isn't it? Like the idea, it's definitely going back to some kind of slightly more elemental version of writer as a storyteller who can just keep spinning a yarn in some way. Yeah, it takes it back to the story and it liberates yeah. from the page. Yeah. Interesting to see how that changes it. I was just thinking that it's, it shouldn't be a big surprise that you were a painter as a child because your writing is so visual. And yeah, it is, it is important. It is, it's clearly important. You always mention colours and, and even it's sort of, it has a kind of, yeah, a kind of watercolour feel to it sometimes the way you describe the city or a landscape. That, that does match the paintings. So yeah. it's really interesting how those two things overlap. I think I, I wanted to be a painter for a while as a child. Really? Yeah, but I sort of was aware that I wasn't really that good at painting. I mean, I, was, I didn't feel like I was terrible at it, but it wasn't the thing that came most easily to me, probably. Do you think that comment by the teacher put you off? You know, I'm sure it did. And also my mum was kind of, she's someone who painted and drew a lot when she was younger and wanted to go to art school and stuff. And, that didn't end up happening for her. So 
you know, I think her opinion, like she was kind of unusual in <laughs> the stuff she would say when I was a kid about um, my paintings, like she would have a definite preference about the ones that she liked and the ones that she wasn't that interested in, you know, unlike of, often parents are kind of just really pleased with anything that child makes. So that's the sort of expectation. Mm. Um, whereas she had a more sort of critical uh, uh, appreciation of things that she liked and didn't like that I did and stuff. So maybe that was it. I don't really know. Um, yeah, something, something put you off that track. But yeah, but maybe it wasn't ever very serious. I had a lot of like alternative um, things that I was excited about doing when I was older, when I was a child, I remember like, I, like one of them was marine biologists because I really liked being underwater and I thought like maybe you'd just get to be like snorkeling and diving the whole time and <laughs> yeah. Well that's so, interesting yeah. as in like, and we'll talk about it in a second how you went on to choose writing as the thing that you really wanted to do and um, but what what I was really interested in is what what kind of books or stories did you imbibe as a child when you were growing up in India and were they different to the stories that you then found when you came to the UK, you know? Um, but first of all, yeah, did you grow up, for example, do you have, did you have the tradition of the bedtime story being read to you? And if so, you know, what kind of stories? Um, so uh, I think different people have different feelings about this, but my mum wasn't a major fan of reading aloud. Um, but, but one thing I really remember that she used to read to me and my brother, my brother is almost five years older, so I guess there wasn't that much kind of um, common commonality in terms of our reading age or whatever. But one thing she used to read to us was poems by A.A. A. Milne. So um, I particularly remember, uh, I think from Now We Are Six and maybe The House at Pooh Corner or something. Um, like I remember the tale of Bad King John and... Um, uh, what's the name of the boy who uh, keeps telling his mother not to go out and go outside? Uh, James, I don't remember. James Weatherby, Weatherby, something, George Dupree. Yeah, took great care of his mother, though he was only three. So like, it was kind of <laughs> stuff like that, I remember. And I remember the illustrations in those books. As a side note, I can't remember who, but somebody was saying on Twitter a while ago that, uh, you know, what, when did it become a thing? Like, where is that age when you're not supposed to want um, a picture in your book anymore? Yeah. And it's yeah. such a good point, like, uh, you know, like Dickens, for example, in the original um, hardbacks would have these illustrations or whatever. Mm. And it's already like you need the illustration to envisage something, but there's just a sort of pleasure in it. Um, so the sort of idea of seriousness kind of in some way being entailed by no pictures, it's kind of, it's curious, isn't it? It's always quite a big step as well when children go from those picture books up to, right. up to just pure text. Yeah. Um, so did you read a, a lot of picture books as a child or were they, um, was there access to those, you know, the, the kind of commercial picture books that we get now here in the UK? Were, were there as many of them over in India? There were amazing we picture have? books and um, my mum, you know, with her sort of painterly eye, definitely had a good eye for the good ones. Mm -hmm. um, they were definitely different from the ones you get now. I think overall in the world, there probably wasn't quite that volume of stuff just for children that well, there is now. It has um, changed a lot, hasn't it, even in the UK? Yeah, I don't even really know what the, what the sort of uh, situation is for uh, books for smaller children now, but I'm sure it's massive, you know, the amount it, of... Yeah. Yeah. But um, there were a lot of things. I obviously had all the books that my brother had had when he was younger. Um, and uh, I actually learned to read when I was three. So what? my first, the first book I read was called, I mean, myself, was called Pop Shop, and it was about... Um, uh, a guy called Pop who had a shop somewhere in America and uh, a dragon came into his shop to buy some toothpaste because the dragon had bad breath. Uh, so that was a picture book. Um, and that was uh, officially a gift from my brother on my third birthday. And that's when my mom told me to read. But I kind of, because everyone in my family read a lot and this was sort of before the days when we even had a TV in the house. Um, I kind of felt like, I, I really distinctly remember sort of, waiting to be able to read, you know, when I was like one and a half and two and stuff, because that's what people did in the evenings and at other times. Oh, wow, that's very early to, to be having those. But I think I was really aware that like, you know, probably like an American child is sort of thinking about when they're going to get their driving license from the time that they're tiny, because people are always, adults are always driving. So um, in my house and in my grandparents' house, people were always reading and they were always really absorbed in a book. So I had this real, I have this real sense of like you know waiting and I used to I remember pick up books and sort of pretend to be able to read them because 
um, because I couldn't do it yet. Wow, and that <laughs> so, includes the children as well. Yeah, everyone who could read, yeah, exactly. So my yeah, brother, everyone. you know, who was five years older, was obviously reading a lot as well, for sure. Amazing. Um, and in terms of picture books, we had these amazing, one of the things we have, I think Salman Rushdie has written about this too. One of the things we have had at that time in India was um, that there were these um, uh, Russian, amazing Russian picture books. So they were uh, kind of things like Russian fairy stories or folk tales. Um, and they had like really beautiful illustrations. And also the books were really beautiful in their production, like really lovely paper and stuff. Um, and those were really, really inexpensive in Bombay at the time. Maybe the Communist Party had some kind of uh, racket going where they had these shops that sold really lovely books. Um, and that was like a way of, of sort of sending money into India. I have no idea, but you, you got these really amazing kind of Russian folk tales um, that were illustrated and other books, just Russian stories and children's books and stuff. Amazing. Yeah. And how about Indian folk tales? Because I was speaking yeah. with a friend who was saying that there, there weren't as many, there weren't as many of the Indian sort of folk tales written down as, as, as you might expect. I mean, was that, was that the case? Well, I think there was, there was a reasonable amount. Um, so the, the sort of publishing house that I really remember was Children's Book Trust, which was a kind of division of uh, the sort of nationalized publishing house at that mm -hmm. time. Um, and Children's Book Trust actually produced some amazing books that I also still remember. Um, like there was what, really lovely illustrations and really nice stories too. There were definitely lots of folk tales and stories from the Panchatantra and um, uh, also I remember an uncle gave us a book of uh, Jataka tales, which are kind of folk tales, but about different incarnations of the Buddha, actually as all these different animals, basically. Wow. Um, and yeah, so there were lots of those. I remember one of the children's books was uh, about a little girl in the sort of Indus Valley civilization. So it was called Maya of Mohenjo-daro. And she was, so it was like kind of, as a small child, you could really relate to it because she was also a small child, but she was doing all of these things that at the time archaeologists thought were happening in the Indus Valley. Like, I don't know, her dad was a potter and she was like going to the baths with her mother and whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I definitely remember that stuff being around there. And obviously there were imported books too. I mean, yeah. um, and actually one of the illustrated things I really remember reading from quite early on was uh, Tintin books, which my mom loves, um, okay. which I really love as well, in yeah. which obviously the illustrations are like a huge part of the story in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. And yeah. when you came over to Leamington Spa, did uh -huh. your tastes in literature change or reading? Or was it was that a continuum? Did you really find that you found the same kind of interest in stories? Yeah, I think I was just reading everything I could get my hands on really, yeah. but there was more stuff that was like the local library at the time, which had a really nice children's section. Mm. It was like a nice Victorian brick building, which I think has been turned into a block of luxury flats. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. I remember reading a lot of like the William books and stuff that they had in the library and uh, just all sorts of stuff and school books as well. Books, in I mean, there was a sort of school library as well. So yeah. And I mean, whatever books that I felt like reading that were around at home as well. Mm -hmm. um, so then you went on and did you, you went to study at Cambridge, English literature uh -huh. at Cambridge at Trinity. And then you went back to India, I believe. Was it straight after that? Or did you no, no, it wasn't. Paris? It wasn't. I had a year in Paris after I graduated. Oh, that's right. um, and that's when I was teaching English in, uh, uh, in the Sorbonne in, in Paris Okay. And then I had three years in London uh, doing various different jobs, like doing a bit of journalism and also teaching French in a, in a kind of crammer in mm. South Kensington and um, lots of temping. Right. And then I went back to India and I worked in the Times of India for three years. Okay. Um, as a reporter and so that was kind of my my first adult life living in Bombay well, actually my first living in Bombay since I was seven years old so it was right. really really fascinating um, uh, and kind of tough in some ways just in terms of you know landing up in a big city which in some ways felt like home but also really not having any friends there because I hadn't lived there since I was tiny um, but not home at the same time yeah yeah I mean yeah exactly I hadn't you know, my, my last major experience of being there was when I was tiny. Yeah. And I hadn't been to school there, I hadn't been to university there and stuff. So it was a whole, it took a little while to start to feel um, like I'd really arrived, I guess. Mm, I can imagine. Yeah. And at what point did you begin to think in your life, um, oh, I'd really like to write? When obviously when you were a child, you were thinking about lots of different things. 
But at what point did you begin to take it seriously or, or was it something that came up later in life and you forgot about, you know, in your, uh, you know, in your teen years? Had you always wanted to write? Um, I had this weird, like, I actually always, before I actually could read and write, I remember kind of like a voice in my head, I think. I think I was probably about two years old, so kind of small. And I remember where I was. I was in um, uh, my bedroom. I mean, the bedroom I shared with my brother, actually, in Bombay. Um, sitting on the floor <laughs> and this voice was kind of like oh you're gonna you're gonna be a writer when you grow wow. up yeah so I always had this um that's just always what I was going to do but I guess I flirted with all these other things in my head like just all the things that I was interested in uh, marine biologist and um I don't you know kind of had deep knowledge yeah know. basically I was always going to do that right yeah. yeah um and so in some ways actually that was kind of um sort of daunting because I always felt I mean I'd always like read other the like, little biography you know of the author at the front of the book mm. and feel slightly tormented like that Scott Fitzgerald published a novel when he was 21 or something and you know um so until I was older than that I'd kind of feel like oh I have to do that and then <laughs> after that it was like oh too late um yeah, you yeah. Get feeling from your late teens and early 20s like no I've got to do everything now otherwise it's over you yeah know? like I, re I remember at 21 feeling super old and super past it you know like yeah. I would have inten intended covertly yeah. to be some kind of prodigy and it obviously I hadn't been yeah so it was just um, like oh. doesn't Leela say something in another country totally she's yeah like, yeah she's like oh I'm you know if I was going to be an author I need to be an author by 21 otherwise it's yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so, and, and so whilst you were a sort of teenager and growing up, did you start putting together stories? Did you start writing yeah. stories? Yeah, so I was actually always writing stories since I was, since I could write. That's the other thing I used to do at the weekends, I think I used to just write like loads of stories. Um, and I never really used to show them to anyone. Uh, and uh, except for when I was 14, I think there was this thing uh, in the, 14, I guess that was in the 90s. I think been going for a while. There was something called the WH Smith Young Writers Competition. Right. And uh, I had, you could send like a poem or a story or something. And I sent two short stories, uh, you, you, which were handwritten. It just seems like some kind of oldy worldy anecdote now. But uh, so I sent these things in and um, they got selected. I don't think I won one of the top prizes, but I got selected. And I, so they were published in, they used to publish a book every year or every two years like Macmillan published this book of the sort of selected pieces like stories and poems from the right. um, from the competition uh, so yeah so that got published but it was, <laughs> it was really, like and I got I kind of got interviewed for local radio and stuff but I felt really shifty about it because in some strange way I sort of intended like for everyone to read my work and um, kind of for my work to have this life outside me but I didn't really want personally, I guess I was just sort of a shy yeah. child. So how old were you there hmm? when that got published? How old were you? I was 15, so it was a year after the, oh, okay. the yeah. entry, yeah. I kind of, and there was, they actually had a book launch for me in like WH Smith, Leamington Spa, and my parents came to it. Um, I mean, I didn't even really want my parents to read the story, not because there was something scandalous in it. I just kind of felt uh, private about it, but obviously... Um, they were just like, well, it's, it's published now, so <laughs> we're going to buy a copy. Yeah. 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 Mixed feelings there. You know, happy to have your work out there, but not... Yeah, I sort of wanted my work to be out there, but I, in some way, wasn't really ready to uh, be the person kind of uh, performing it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the first time you thought of the fact that you would have to also perform it as well as just write it. Because it's such a... Oh, no, I've been making up pen names for myself since I was like tiny also. I can't right. really remember most of them, but yeah. Okay. But then obviously the funny thing is that when you finally have a novel published, you know, when you're, I think I was 32, maybe when my first book came out. At that point, like you've been sort of admitting to at least some of your friends through the years, that that's what you want to do and stuff. Mm -hmm. So when it finally happens, you know, I didn't even consider having a pen name. I was just like, no, no, my name will be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've earned this now. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So from that point on, from 15 years old on, did you, did, when did you start thinking about writing novels? Did you write, uh, any, did you try any other forms other than short stories? No, I didn't. I always, I wasn't really sure how anyone would write a novel. And I guess I never had 
read one of those sort of how to write novel books and it wasn't really as much of a creative writing wasn't as much of a, a field in, in those no. days from as far as I can remember I was dimly aware of the UEA MA but I seem to remember reading some Sunday Times magazine article about it that sort of implied or said that you know established novelists would go off and do the MA after having published several novels and stuff which I don't think is true at all anyway but that was kind of the PR that it was okay. super difficult to get into and I never even considered I think just things like careers advice and stuff were not um, amazing in those days. I remember there was like a computerized test in school. That yeah, you could, that. And about 60% of us got told that we should do fish farming. Maybe the, maybe the software was like sponsored by <laughs> the kind of fish farming industry. It was pretty bizarre. Maybe so, was um, but yeah, I didn't even really know that there were things like creative writing degrees, I think. Uh, I certainly didn't apply for any. And I don't, I'm not sure I was aware that there were things like English and creative writing. Mm. And maybe there weren't so many at that point, undergraduate degrees. I don't know. So that never really occurred to me. And um, I just, I probably, I would have considered applying to either do philosophy or maybe French um, or English, um, which were all the subjects that I liked. But then in the end, I just figured like, you know, I really wanted to read novels and plays and poems. I didn't necessarily want to read like turgid contemporary philosophy articles or whatever for three years. So yeah, so I went to university to do English. And so when you began your career, you know, you started working in London and then eventually back to India. Were you thinking, OK, I'll carry on writing, but I need to get a proper career so that I an alternative career as well so that I can continue, you know, to live? Was that? Yeah, I've had a lot of people telling me from my parents down, but not just my parents. Um, I mean, I didn't when I was younger. I can't remember when I started. I, maybe I didn't really tell people I wanted to be a writer till I was till I was like, in my late 20s I mean just generally tell people and I feel like whenever I did whoever it was would be like well you know they'd say sort of range of things including well you can't make a living at that you know yeah and also that's very very difficult and you probably won't get published or even like when you're like I mean when you're quite young people would say things like have you had anything published in a kind of you know don't talk rubbish way um <laughs> so yeah I just stopped saying it and um do you think it put you off yeah, I think it was sort of meant to. I think people, um, it was just a different era and people, there were probably more people around with sort of unfulfilled creative urges themselves who just felt that that was the case and felt they should say that. I, a lot of people would say you can't make a living doing that. And um, that's not actually true. No. So, you, yeah. You didn't get wholesale encouragement. No, I mean, but that's okay. You know, it, it, I didn't have a sort of, incredibly difficult life either but I guess I just absorbed all of these messages quite unquestioningly in some way I didn't really oh and I think that you know studying English at university was also quite a um it was sort of amazing in many ways but it really um made someone like me uh kind of stamp out my my writing in a way I Are think basically fun? after after well there was a lot of focus on the sort of finished object and um there wasn't much sense of the process that a writer goes through in producing that object. Right. Um, not that we'd never talked about things like drafts, but I think there was just a sense of like the people who were in the canon of literature were amazing writers to begin with. There wasn't really much of a feeling of like you're learning to do something and you go through a whole process and the first few times maybe it's not so great. And then, you know, that, that the kind of looking at things from the point of view of being the person who may make them, Mm. versus looking at things from the point of view of being a person who is able to intelligently sort of comment on them or assess them or something. Right, um, yeah. it's, quite, it's quite a different point of view, right? It's exactly. like you're always the restaurant critic, you're never just making dinner. Yeah, and criticism is famously not so good for creativity, so... I, I don't know if that's true. I think there are different ways of doing criticism and some of the criticism I really enjoy is done by practitioners. Oh, and I think that's really interesting. But, but, but on, a finished project, on, on a finished product, I suppose, as you're... Create, yeah create. yeah but so the idea that you know um you can learn to do stuff and it's not like i think i thought ta talent was some kind of litmus test of just you literally like you were a piece of paper and you were dipped in this solution and and you know either it came out a certain color and you were a genius or it didn't and you weren't yeah um so uh so did you put the the ambition of writing your own novel on the back burner then for a while Mm, sort of. I also felt like I had to experience more stuff. Like I didn't want to write, and I didn't. I didn't want to write some kind of novel about someone who was exactly like me. Mm. Um, I wanted to, uh, like, know more about life, really. Yeah. Um, without really knowing what that would mean. 
teens. So uh, I guess that's what I spent the next 10 years doing, <laughs> just finding out more about people and what it's like to be an adult in the world in some sense. Yeah. Fantastic. So you decided to come and join the Masters at UEA. Right. Before that point, had you written, had you written a fully fledged novel? No, not at all. I started like, I'd started one novel um, when I was in my mid twenties, I think, but I only got a few chapters in. I just had a kind of vague idea about it. I didn't really have, I had a sort of um, manifesto for it. I didn't really have a, a story and I had half a character or something. Yeah. And then did you get so far and think, I don't know how to move this forward. I'm just going to leave this here for a while. Yeah, I just kind of, it just petered out really. I, so since I left university, since I graduated from uh, my first degree, I didn't really finish that many stories. I would still write, mm -hmm. but I think the way I expressed my kind of worry about where it could go or where it would fail to go was just that I didn't really finish any of them. Yeah. Whereas when I was a child, I would write probably a story every weekend, at least, and I'd always finish it. I didn't really revise it because I didn't know about that. <laughs> or I didn't revise it much. Maybe I'd copy it out again and kind of change some things. But, um, but I didn't have a problem finishing things. It was just, I think later that was sort of a way of saying I'm doing this, but I'm also not doing this. I don't know. Yeah, but, interesting. And so when you joined the Masters, what was... Were you thinking, okay, this is going to get me to write a novel? Was that your aim when you decided? I think I just wanted to write better. Yeah, I did want to publish a book. And I guess I knew that it's difficult to publish short stories in a lot of the Anglophone world. But I didn't really have a novel idea. Um, that sort of came a few months in when I started writing a story. And um, one of my friends said to me, oh, this feels like it's actually the start of something. It doesn't feel like a self-contained short story. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And how hard for you was it to make that leap from writing, thinking about writing a short story to then developing it? So that became Saraswati Park. Yeah. Right. And that's such an accomplished novel, you know. For, so that was your first full novel. Yeah. Amazing. How did you, how did you make that leap from writing short stories to, to feeling, you know, it is a different form. It's a very different form. I how, think, yeah. I, I think kind of having ideas in the interim period, you know, like ideas about how to flesh out your stories, or was it something that you tested out in that first novel as you wrote? So I didn't really know anything about writing even a novel draft. Um, and my friend Christy, who was also one of my housemates, she said, just write 500 words every day mm. and don't look at it for a while. Okay. And that was such a great piece of advice, which I've passed on to many other people. Um, so it would, and it kind of worked like, you know, one of the things at least I had a fear of about writing a novel was like, how do you even get to that sort of length? Mm. You know, how do you accumulate that much stuff? But actually, it's not that difficult if you're not um, also, you know, putting in other demands like it needs to make sense or whatever it is. You know, if you're just writing things around that, then you kind of have your mind on those characters and that situation. And there's lots of sort of exploratory stuff that maybe you're not going to use in the finished thing, but that can keep you in that world in a way. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I did. And I think it also made a big difference being around other people who were doing the same thing, by which I don't just mean writing. I mean, thinking about writing and wondering if they could write and encouraging themselves and reading and, and all that stuff, you know, mm. people who were at a similar kind of stage in some ways as I was. I mean, some were older, some were younger, some had done more related things and some had been doing like very, very different things for many years. But the point was that we were all kind of admitting to wanting to write and actually committed to learning how or figuring out how and sort of helping yeah. each other figure out how and that made a big difference. The community of writers. Yeah. 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 Not being not being the only weirdo. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, it made a big difference. Amazing. And so had you a finished draft by the time you finished the Masters or did you go no, on? No, no. Um, I think I'd written... Um, I, well, I did, we had to hand in a dissertation of 15,000 words, so I must have written that much. Mm. Um, so like a, qu a quarter or something. And I, I had, didn't have a finished draft. I had a very, um, I don't remember when my first like, sort of draft was done, but I think I had a very loose draft. I've actually written most, except for the second one, I've written most books that way where I have something that I kind of personally call a proto draft. So it's basically just like a lump of matter yeah. that is roughly as long as a book. And most of it is not going 
and go in the book, but there's something reassuring about having it. Um, you know, just like you know that if somebody came along with their book-sized weighing shovel and said, is this a book? Like, at least it would weigh as much as a book should weigh. A physical object. You've got stuff, yeah. You've got stuff, and it might not be the stuff you actually want, but at least you've got the stuff. Yeah. And then you can uh, start looking at it and figuring out what it wants to be. Again, apart from the second book where I had more of a clear structure in terms of three places and a sort of, mm. you know, progression for that. But overall, I think often it's through the writing that I figure out what the book wants to be in some ways. Interesting. Yeah. You allow the creative process to, it's, it's quite organic, it feels, the way that you write. Yeah, and it's quite in the dark. A lot of it is quite in the dark. Yeah, in the dark. And you discover it. How, how far has that changed now that you've learned more about structure and more about the storytelling process and you teach yourself? Do you think there's more of a back and forth between the organic way that you write and the planning side of your brain? Um, when I was first, uh, when I was writing Saraswati Park and um, I was doing my master's, um, I had access to the UEA library and there were loads of like how to write type of books. Mm. So I kind of tortured myself by reading a bunch of them. And um, a lot of them were written by supposedly best-selling novelists that I hadn't really ever heard of, but I think who were maybe writing more like um, slightly more genre-specific fiction with, which has more clear sort of parameters of what a reader will expect. Um, and I remember that one of them, I don't remember the title or the author, but one of those kind of how to write a best-selling novel sort of thing, books, was one of the tips in it was about plotting out, um, you know, they had would have some stuff about these these basic shapes, like the hero's journey or whatever, but also tips that were maybe in some ways more related to things like screenwriting, about plotting out yeah. arc of the novel and then each scene. And But one of the sort of uh, key points in this book was buy index cards or use index cards, uh, which I must have translated to myself as buy index cards. So I bought like <laughs> packets of index cards and then obviously didn't really know what to do with them. Um, but it was only later, there's a lot of stuff, I felt like there's a lot of stuff um, that you learn about writing a novel after you've written your first novel and you talk to other novelists and they say, oh yeah, it's the same for me. But that people don't really tell you even when you're studying creative writing. Yeah. So I try to put some of that into the um, online creative writing courses that I've written because I feel like... Um, they're not exactly secrets, but they're sort of things it's not unhelpful to know. Like very often with a more literary novel, by which I mean a novel that is interested not just in kind of uh, event and a series of, of narrative sort of um, moments, but actually also in things like language or atmosphere or character or, you know, a bunch of other stuff that yeah. it might not be as dramatic uh, or as continually dramatic, but... but um, in those kind of novels, very often the writer is writing in that way. Like very often they don't know, you know, they maybe they, I often know what the end is going to be and I know what the start is going to be, but I don't, and I know some of the things along the way, but I don't really know the whole thing. I mean, I find out as I go. And yeah. that's not that uncommon for that kind of novel. No. And do you think that's something that's particular to novel? I mean, of course, you can't necessarily know, but through your writing, you do have quite an interesting craft and craftsmanship and, and, you know, you've written about the letter writer and the shoemakers. And are you, I, I always wondered if that was something to do with the way things are made and also yeah. kind of ticking over the kind of the daily practice of the quiet way we go about making something. Yeah. And, and I wondered, yeah, if, if that's something that you see in your own work as being a craft that's coming out of that daily practice. I think I used to identify with that sort of idea even more strongly and it hasn't, um, I don't think it's rubbish now, but I was really interested in that idea of craft and having a craft because I think there's a real dignity and beauty to it as well, you know, and there's also the sort of happiness of knowing that um, every hour you spend doing something counts, even if it's not, you know, a finished pair of sandals that you're going to sell or a scene that's going to go in the finished published novel. Mm. Um, you're just getting better at something and you're spending time doing this thing that you really love. So, um, yeah, that that's, really a, comes out in your fiction. That's, that's a really consoling, nice thought for me. Yeah. Um, but actually I've become more interested in some sort of, uh, some sort of analog to, um, to magic for want of a better word now for the creative process. And, and when I say analog, I mean, even considering the kind of magic that happens all the time in the world that we don't really label magic, whether it's, uh, you know, two cell, maybe not two cells, two very small organisms kind of fusing and then like 
a whole human being coming out of them or just the way that trees grow or whatever like all of the sort of on the face of it incredibly elaborate and um almost unlikely if you look at it from some completely rational point of view um processes that life is is uh, sustaining the entire time i think that maybe creativity is more like that where it's actually just about bringing about the conditions in which that kind of growth can take place mm. um you know and and some of that some of that is about being open some of it is about being experimental some of it is just about not taking yourself too seriously in the short term you know but understanding that you're just part of this whole overall mechanism of life mechanism is not the right word but part of this whole overall organism of life mm. and that life itself wants to come through everyone and being creative isn't some kind of um special mode it's just uh completely natural <laughs> so you know and it takes obviously it takes different forms for different people for some people it's it's being athletic and sporty or whatever and for some people it's cooking and for some people it's um their relationships and whatever but it but it or some people it's i don't know political ambition or being on stage or something um but there is often something that wants to come through you in a given moment and it's just sort of being um receptive to that and and kind of finding the conditions that help it to happen most easily hmm. yeah allow it, allowing it to happen rather than yeah. artistically trying to create something yourself almost like the idea of the muses in a way the magic yeah. the magic not that you're touched by a muse but you allow whatever force that is yeah is is that when I mean, that comes through in your most recent novel i think yeah and we we were discussing this so I'm not, I was lucky to read an earlier draft and there's the whole symbol well it's not symbol but it, you do, you have always written in a realist form before mm -hmm. i would say you know they yeah. were quite realist and this is still in the realist vein but it kind of stretches it we were saying mm -hmm. and there's room for something else there something maybe it's it's almost kind of that spark that you were talking about um you know the the kind of electricity that's running all the way through the text yeah actually more i think i think that that novel more than any of your others has more of a formal structure in terms right. of story which is interesting yeah it also has more of a sense of almost an otherworldly presence that is never explained mm -hmm. both within the character of kitechi is that how i pronounce it Ketiki, yeah he and and within the plot itself through yeah. the, through you know what happens there is is that something that you were keen to somehow get into the form of the novel was it a yeah, absolutely. yeah so i wrote this essay about it um for uh boundless which is uh un unbound unbound unbounded unbound unbound yeah, yeah unbound uh, online magazine and um but, and I wrote about some of the stuff that I was reading when I was living in Assam. So um, between 2014 and 2017, I was living in Assam in the northeast of India, mm. and um, which is really, really different from the, the mainland of India, as people uh, who live in the uh, northeast states refer to the kind of main chunk of India, the mainland. Um, and so one of the things I was doing when I was there was trying to learn Assamese, and I had... Um, uh, lessons and um, I one of the ways that I tried to learn was by reading uh, some classic short stories very slowly <laughs> with what, what, kind of a succession of two teachers um, including the second one was my friend's grandmother who lived across the road uh, who was an amazing person um, and it sadly just passed away but but so we read these these classic short stories obviously slowly because you know linguistically they weren't like the simple they weren't the cab wasn't sitting on the mat it was a bit more complicated yeah um but i was just really fascinated um the one i wrote about in that essay is called uh patmugi and it's a apparently very realist sort of 19th century story it's, it's actually not 19th century it's published in the probably around 1930 30s or early 30s i would say um and it's by the kind of most famous uh, most famous i guess 20th century assamese writer um so it begins in this sort of incredibly realist way and then this strain of what i call enchantment comes into it but that's very very muted it just becomes apparent that that is sort of that the story is actually not about what it seems to be about it's actually about this other thing which will never be incredibly specifically named or quantified and then there's this sort of coda of the story which is brilliant which is where the the kind of narrator 
um, who's written the story down and sent it off to publication for publication to a magazine gets a note back from his friend that he sent it to for an opinion. And the friend is sort of saying, honestly, this is just a really rubbish story and it's just like a really everyday event. And, you know, I can't believe it. And it's the kind of unlikely twist of the narrator. That's this guy falling in love with this girl that he's known his whole life, who's the same age as his daughter. It's just nonsense. And, and why don't you write about something that's more worthy of actually being in a story? Hmm. But from being this sort of realist, you know, maybe slightly modernist story, it goes into this whole postmodern kind of moment where the narrator's describing sending off the story and his friend's not very encouraging letter. And then he concludes by saying, oh, well, you know, maybe this is just like a kind of um, string bag of a story that, that will carry the reader along, but not very far from the ground. You know, this, in a sense, there's this idea of almost the enchantment in the story that carries you away, but, it, but he's not um, aspiring for that enchantment to be something kind of huge and sweeping. It's more like, okay, you've been lifted off the ground, but like a couple of inches, you know, not very far, <laughs> which is really, really interesting. And this idea of, um, the mm, sort of magical, but that's very much inherent in life, not mm -hmm. the magical as something separate that sprouts out of life in a sort of noticeably different and weird way, but more just the idea that maybe actually magic is one of the, or what we call magic is one of the things that um, makes life go. Yeah. Um, I really love that. And I think it's sort of, uh, it rings true for me. Fantastic. And so would you say that was the key kind of, inspiration when you were writing or was there other yeah. ones as well that you then turned to to look at how you might be able to accommodate that in your form did you read any novels and then think okay I'm going to play you know did you think about it in 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 terms of that kind of formalistic way or did you then just allow your own novel to take its own shape based on that idea I think I'd been thinking about, I don't know, I can't remember what led to thinking about it again, but I'd been thinking about Great Expectations by Dickens, which is one of my favorite novels. Yeah. And I think it's a really sort of consummate novel. It's kind of an amazing novel. One of the things I've always loved about it is that I feel like it uses that 19th century novel format, but to actually write about what I think of as, as karma. So there are all of these returns in the novel, like, you know, there are people that, that uh, Pip as a child knows in this village who seem like kind of ridiculous, very Dickensian characters, like overblown and sort of silly, but who come back later, you know, and the whole story is about this difference that he as an older ex person experiences between, um, between being a child and projecting outwards to the life he imagines he's going to have and the hero he imagines he's going to be. And also then the fact that in a way he can't completely put aside the conditions of his life as it's been that, that all of these things have left a mark and it's actually those things that have to be worked through in some way uh, for him to become an adult um, so I think those sort of uh, mirrorings and that kind of whole process of um, things returning and things being inverted and the way that that novel does that I just really love so I was sort of thinking about Dickens and I think I reread Our Mutual Friend as well okay um, yeah so I was sort of intrigued by this idea of a serial novel um, and I think I was really stimulated by the fact that Assam is a very readerly place, right. um, which was another thing I really loved as soon as I had moved there, that, that I would have conversations, like, it was a place where, you know, if people asked you what you did and you said, um, I write fiction, it was so nice because instead of um, in some of the big cities in India, in the rest of India, maybe they'd be like, oh, do you know so-and-so, or have you ever written a film, or, you know, it's kind of a much more... Um, uh, journalistic sort of assessment of what does that mean and yeah, how interesting I But in Assam, everyone was that I talked to, whether it was like the person at the gas office when I had to get my my kind of cooking gas connected, or you know someone uh, driving a rickshaw, uh, they would be like, "Oh, okay, uh, I really like reading, and I just read this book, and I really like this writer for this reason," you know. And then I'd talk about a book I really liked that I'd read, and it was so nice. There was a real feeling of this is a really really literary culture. Mm genuine um, of the stories yeah and, there, and a real appetite for uh for that so there are a lot of literary magazines and mm. there's a real culture of like um uh you know stories being appear uh, stories appearing and people talking about them and as well as obviously books being published and stuff so that also made a big difference um that in a way it's a continually ongoing conversation not necessarily a sort of a writer going off uh and sitting in a room and then every few years producing this sort of finished thing and selling it yeah less mechanistic yeah less mechanistic and it's more like a part of everyday life like you're always writing a story and you're always talking about what you're reading and you know 
fantastic. A yeah. bit like um, I've heard the, the culture is like in Iceland, where stories are supposed to be right. for everyone, you know, much more. Much more is not an author here and everyone else here yeah, listening yeah. to that. Uh, stories are supposed to be shared and, and, and anyone can tell a story. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking as you were talking, it's kind of a natural progression as well, I feel, from where you started writing as a child. Right. You know, allowing the stories to come to come and, and you know, starting with short stories. And um, and then the kind of voice that you acquired when you wrote your novels was a voice that was often from someone who was felt they were an outsider. Right. You know, and and in, in that way, it was kind of portrayed through noticing. You know, yeah. Mahan in the first novel in Saraswati Park, he's, you know, he, he often, I don't know, he's quite sub subversive in the way that he'll just take a few moments from the day and, and sit there and watch the colours or the clouds, yeah. or watch people, and sort of almost leaving space for something to come through. And it felt like that kind of, gain momentum within your novels almost to become a kind of I don't know a kind of form I don't mm -hmm. you know so in the living the living for me it felt like it was comprised of those moments that people wouldn't usually think of as being extremely exciting turns yeah. of but that was the beauty of that novel was that it was like okay this is this is what life's about these moments uh, an accumulation of moments and sometimes they take a turn yeah. And so it makes a, a sense that you then have left space for this more magical idea of, you know, space in your literature. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. There is a kind of progression through. Yeah, I probably can't see that as kind of clearly. <laughs> yeah, it's like for yeah. other people to see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, interesting. So in terms of, I was just thinking though, and also the, there's a genuine love of the, the telling of the story and the listening yeah. of the story as opposed to the public figure of the author right saying you the very first the very first time that you were published you suddenly had a jolt where you're like i'm not sure yeah. I want that. do you feel more comfortable with it now that you you're you know i think so i think i've gotten i've become more comfortable with it um uh but it definitely took a while at first i um felt it felt very strange um, and I've seen some writers who are incredibly good at having that public persona. Maybe they have more of an extrovert in them also. And, you know, they're really good at uh, performing in a sense on, on stage. Yeah. Um, in front of an audience and stuff. And I really didn't feel that for a while. But I think I just began to feel more natural about it. It sort of well, happened in parallel to with, um, with teaching classes, uh, which is something I was doing when I was 21 as mm -hmm. well. But, but you know not necessarily feeling super comfortable doing it um i think it just i i, I become i became aware that there were kind of more uh, aspects of me in some sense like that i could be different in these different worlds whether it was being different in when i was in india or when i was in england or whether i was in front of um kind of a class or an audience or at home and I just sort of wanted to, in some way, integrate these things, not necessarily to be exactly the same in all of them, because obviously, for example, if you're teaching, you're making more effort to um, project outwards and, and kind of involve other people, whereas mm. if you're home on your own, you can be quite interior. But I just wanted to feel as comfortable. You know, I wanted to feel like me in all of them. I didn't want to feel like I had to, um, I don't know, put on some kind of armor for any of them or, or play a role. So I think I made a sort of conscious effort to just try and do everything in a way that felt more comfortable um, and therefore more like me. Fantastic. And do you think the writing of your novels helped with that? And I'm just thinking of another country, which is set across three countries, yeah. those countries that you lived in before you began publishing. And it felt a little like almost it was drawing links between them all, you know, try, it was very much about finding identity as a 20 something across all of these different cultures almost trying to draw bridges in a way so do you feel like your writing in a way helped you to kind of feel more confident in the person that you are so that you could be a more confident public author in a way you were kind of knitting your life together through your work oh that's a really good idea but no i don't feel that at all <laughs> um no it was more like with another country actually i think one of the things that sort of impelled writing that was um 
one of the things I really wanted to write about, and I sort of did in a not very um, uh, overt way in that book, was that in my 20s, at least, I felt a real sense of grief about um, exactly that kind of sense of magic in the world that I had as a child. Mm. The sort of uh, simplicity of things like creativity or just expressing yourself or a lot of things, a way of being in a way, that mm -hmm. there was a kind of almost um, a connection to myself that I had when I was a younger child that somehow as I grew older and then became a young adult, um, I'd sort of lost and that I really felt grief for in my 20s. Like there was in my 20s, everything felt quite performative. I was always trying to do whatever the right thing was. And there was no single person telling me what was the right thing. I think it was just that I had an idea of someone or multiple people who were out there knowing how to be an adult and knowing how to have savoir faire and, you know, behave in relationships or make other people like them or whatever it was. Um, and so I was always trying to fit in with that abstracted other person who was getting it right. Yeah. And I never really could just be, um, you know, and then obviously later I just realized that there wasn't really any abstracted person who was always getting it right and that's not actually how you do living <laughs> you know you don't you don't kind of look at someone else and find out how to be exactly like them and, and be acceptable you yeah just start by accepting whatever's happening including all the untidy things um so I think I think what led me to sort of this process of I mean it's mainly just aging isn't it I'm, I would imagine well, we've all kind of gone through some of that yeah not everyone gets there but maybe yeah um, yeah, I've sort of alternated periods of my life of, of being quite um, placid with periods of kind of lots of upheavals, whether it's moving country or sort of ending a relationship or something. So I think, I think after a certain amount of kind of um, ups and downs, maybe there's some wanting to return to this kind of quiet place inside or integrate these two things. You know, I think in another country too, there's this sense of that observer inside yourself that is sort of recording things or, or aware of things without being so involved in the drama, even though there was, there is a lot of drama in your twenties, a lot of, yeah. um, and so at least in mine and in <laughs> lots of my friends' lives, I think there was a lot of drama or surface drama. So I think um, kind of making friends with that observer, kind of making space for both of those perspectives, like mm. making space for the perspective of being really involved in things, but also making space for the perspective of, of kind of watching yourself live your life in some way, that, that's been um, a big part of my writing. Right. Uh, yeah, and I think that's probably in various ways sort of enabled um, some kind of getting more comfortable with myself, but it's a kind of process, isn't it? I mean, it's Absolutely. a... Yeah, it's a, and actually, uh, Everlasting Lucifer, the, the working title, um, and the, in fact, the first thing that came to me about the book was that was the phrase "keeping in touch." Mm. I think I was having coffee with a friend in Norwich, and uh, uh, she was saying that she was just she said, "Oh, I'm rubbish at keeping in touch with friends or something." And I was a little bit hungover, and this phrase "keeping in touch" kind of hung in my head, and I was like, "Oh, I'm going to my next book is going to be called Keeping in Touch," um, and I think it was kind of the idea of staying in touch with yourself, staying in touch with this more sort of a uh, peaceful perspective in yourself mm -hmm. but the awareness that that's not necessarily for me like I don't think my idea of enlightenment living in the world is something like you know it happens and then it's done it's more like it's this process of returning to yourself which means kind of losing it sometimes and then coming back losing it and coming back it's a sort of continual return it's a kind of stitching together it's not just one um, change not one big moment where something yeah. arrives. I felt that came through very strongly in the living. You know, that sense of, it was a quieter novel. It had shorter sentences, shorter chapters. Yeah. And almost like glances, you know, through, through a window of somebody's life. But it had that sense of peacefulness that there wasn't necessarily in another country, which was more of a searching novel. Mm -hmm. And interesting then, how how it's moved on since then um i i felt like there's always been space also for a specifically female perspective what whatever that means but in terms of i felt like in everlasting lucifer that it, it becomes a little bit more political than any of your other novels in in that way uh -huh. way that you're talking about you know the kind of role of women in the world and how they're treated and and how we might fight back against that not 
or not really fight back, but you know, it's very much looking at the, the you know, relationships and, and where women sit. And had you been thinking a lot about that? Had you been reading many specifically female authors or did, did, did that just come up naturally through the theme of magic and electricity? I think it came up naturally through, through um, the things I was interested in at the time. One of which is that in the east of India, including Assam, uh, like in Bengal, Orissa, Assam, <coughs> among other places, there's a lot of uh, specifically goddess worship. Um, I mean, it's there all over India, but it's but there's more of a kind of focus on, uh, like for example, Durga Puja, which is a, a, a tradition from Bengal, but it's also in uh, several of the other eastern regions, um, where there's a kind of ten-day worship of the of the goddess Durga. So maybe that was part of it. This idea of um, <coughs> goddess worship isn't necessarily sort of directly about uh, women in a kind of simple way. It's more like the idea of celebrating feminine force, mm. which, um, <coughs> sorry, which in Hinduism is, uh, the word is Shakti in, in Sanskrit. And Shakti is um, unlike in some traditions where say, what is associated with the male, the idea of masculinity is in some way dynamic and the female is in some way more passive. Mm. <coughs> in Hinduism, it's actually the opposite. Like you kind of need both poles. It's just like, uh, a one and a zero in binary language. It's not that um, one is better or something or that you can have exclusively one mode. Yeah. But the feminine force is much more dynamic and actually kind of uh, potentially violent, even if it's, if it's not grounded, it's, it's very strong. Okay. So there's a sort of idea maybe of um, embracing that quality of what femininity can be like, as well as... Uh, it's sort of maybe coming into your, and this sounds incredibly cheesy, but coming into your power as a woman, which doesn't mean trying to be like some sort of external image of power, mm. <coughs> but maybe just um, accepting what it's like to be you and sort of owning it. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. And in terms of where you are now, <coughs> yeah, you have you been writing? Um, are you, have you been working on your next project? Because I know you're putting a lot of energy into the painting and getting things up online. Have yeah. you had any space or have you, have you felt the desire to write during lockdown? Have you, yeah, are you working on your next project? I am, but I think it's going to take quite a lot of research. So I'm actually doing a lot of reading. Okay. Um, and one of the other things I did during lockdown, which was really fun, but also obviously time consuming, um, was that I was a judge on the Singapore... Uh, uh, the Singapore Book Council has a literature prize every couple of years and in fact the winner is going to be announced tomorrow uh, but online now. Um, so that was one of the other things I was doing that ended up being um, quite uh, a preoccupation naturally like if you're reading uh, I think it was like 38 novels or something in a month or whatever like wow. that was a big um, but it was kind of amazing as well and I learned a lot about Singapore which actually has made me sadder about not being able to go to Singapore for the <laughs> for the prize ceremony. Yeah. Um, but maybe some other time. Uh, yeah, so that took up some time. And then I was also, uh, and I'm still also kind of uh, obsessing about drawing and painting quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I started last year when I was in Ireland, I got really interested in um, this family um, from a tiny uh, Protestant town called Castle Townsend in, in um, uh, West Cork, and um, especially one of them. And so, uh, during lockdown, I kind of started doing a bit more, uh, if not preparation for research, I would say, like basically ordering a whole bunch of books, making reading lists, contacting people, all that kind of thing. So, and I think I've got a long way to go, even in the preliminary research. I've never, mm. I guess in some ways, there's a sort of historical aspect to it. I've never had a dream of writing a historical novel, but I think I've probably said many times, I'll never write a historical novel. And I remember someone saying to me years ago, um, oh, you should never say, I'd never do that because life will always find a way of <laughs> challenging you. Yeah. So I'm sure if I spent the next like five years saying, I'll never do a bungee jump, you know, in five years time, I'd probably be standing at the top of something tall, like with elastic around my waist. Oh. Um, <laughs> Sometimes you challenge your setting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's gonna happen. Sorry? Clearly it's going to happen now. 
slowly yeah 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 uh -huh. so i'm basically doing a lot of reading for that i and i think that's one aspect that has sort of changed um in terms of you were asking about planning and reading the novel aloud and stuff i think if you're writing something that where obviously you're going to need to do a whole bunch of research i mean i've done research for other books but it's taken weeks rather than sort of months. Mm. Um, but if there is that much research, a certain amount of planning wouldn't go amiss, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, and I you're just taking like longer. Yeah. To sort of take the run up. It's a good time for it now as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a good time to kind of be um, at home reading rather than trying to travel around do, doing other types of research, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, Anjali, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been lovely chatting to you. <laughs> if people want to ask you any questions, if they've heard, you know, if they have any anything that they would like to sort of say to you, how would they best contact you? Would it be Twitter? Yeah, or I guess, yeah, Twitter or Instagram, or I have a website as well, and you, so you could send me an email through that. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, thank you very much to the Bagri Foundation for having us. Thank you yes. for coming on. Thanks and um, yeah, lovely to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>